introduction to who you are and what you do and your role at Outsurance. Okay, I'm Suren Naidu. I'm at, at present the Chief People Officer for the company, which encompasses managing the um, human resources, um, our learning academy, our um, health and wellness leadership functions um, as well. Um, I've been at Outsurance, in fact, this is going of June 20. 22 will be my 20th year at Alturance. Wow. Um, it's been it's been an epic innings that I'm quite proud of. It's amazing. That's amazing. Wow. So you've been there for a long time. You know what's potting. You've slowly. I was I was reading a lot about you on the website. Um, just trying to see a bit more about what you do and everything. And I saw okay. you've slowly worked your way up. Um, position by position. You've experienced a whole d- bunch of different things within Alturance, and now you are where you are, yeah. which is just so awesome. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. So what I wanted to ask you is, as you know, I know you, you chatted a lot to Mark and yeah. we are trying to run a kind of campaign in which we kind of address different businesses and see their, their take on what's going on in the pandemic and how it's impacted business. So what I want to do is ask you a couple of questions just to get your perspective on these kinds yeah. of things. So obviously you being um, in HR, means that you deal very closely with employees. You are probably one of the first people to find out about any employee issues, along with client issues and everything in yeah. between. So what I wanted to ask you is, as a whole, how do you feel the pandemic has impacted, firstly, the employees, but also the clients in terms of their financial wellness, their emotional wellness, and their physical wellness? How, what kind of impact have you felt? I mean, I think the impact has been significant, um, but the impact has kind of tracked the levels of lockdown that we've gone through. Yes. Um, I mean, there was a period of hard lockdown where, you know, we couldn't run our business, uh, where we had to have a few staff um, available to assist clients at the time. And I think that was almost the extreme end where we had to pivot at short yes. notice. You know, the, the, the announcements um, by government caught us a little bit off guard. Uh, we've had to pivot from a perspective of setting people up to work from mm-hmm. home, but do so in, in numbers that were manageable because there were huge global challenges with laptop supply and those types of things. Um, to, you know, the current level one where, you know, things are a bit more relaxed. We've learned a lot from the last 18 months. Um, we're far more comfortable managing our operational and people pressures as mm-hmm. well as the pandemic as well and ensuring that we do so in a kind of um, in, in a responsible way. Um, so, so it's been, I think the pandemic has been massive without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, what, um, what is probably the most significant thing is that the pandemic would have either highlighted um, cracks that businesses had had prior to the pandemic or not. Um, so if your business, whether you're talking about financially or in terms of client service or in terms of your employee value proposition, mm-hmm was on wobbly ground prior to the pandemic, it would have definitely been exposed during the pandemic. Yes. Um, and I think we were quite fortunate there because we, as Alturans, have a pretty strong organizational culture. Uh, we believe our culture is the big reason for our success. Mm-hmm. It's a client and a people-centered culture. And we believe that that culture that we had pre-pandemic was what kind of got us through Thank the you. difficulties of the yeah. pandemic. Um, but without a doubt, I mean, the pandemic, you know, it's a once in a generation um, a, um, sort of event and the impact on businesses and our clients and our people um, has been immense. Yeah, that's such an awesome answer. And it's really true. I've never thought about it like that, that it really does. The pandemic was almost this big reveal of what had been going on behind closed doors and all these different businesses because of course as you said everybody struggled everybody felt some sort of impact but the businesses that had some sort of plan in place or some sort of um employee schemes and things like that those are the those are the businesses that survived you know so it's it's really good to think about and you know i think it's obviously late now to have everybody Mm. thinking this way but imagine if the whole world had thought about employee wellness proactively Mm. months ago or years ago and how it would have made such a difference and that actually leads to our next question which is yes in in your professional opinion because as as you've said and as we've we've discussed you have so much experience in this field you've been um at outsurance alone for as you said nearly 20 years so trust your opinion here why do you think it's important or in, in better words why is it vital to create a healthy workforce um why is helping people and helping our employees with their mental, physical, 
and their financial wellness. Why is that so yeah. vital to employee and business success? Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's obvious internal factors, sort of mm. things within the business. But I think before I even discuss those, I think, you know, within the South African context, you have to um, acknowledge some of the challenges we have as a country and mm. the access to resources that, um, or the limitations that we have in terms of access to resources at community level, etc. Mm. And I think South African businesses as a, as a whole have realized that they have to plug the gap that's left through um, service delivery mm-hmm. challenges, especially in terms of health and wellness in the bigger communities. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we've been very blessed, I think, in South Africa, more so than I think other global businesses where there's always been this view that corporate South Africa has to be socially responsible, yeah. that it has to ensure that we um, we don't just view our employees in isolation at work, but view them as part of a bigger exactly. system, and that system includes the community, the health and wellness, etc. So, South African corporates, I think, generally have done well in the wellness mm-hmm. space, even prior to COVID, um, because, you know, many of our staff cannot just simply wake up in the morning and go and access a world-class healthcare facility exactly. in their neighborhood. Um, they don't have those resources. Mm-hmm. Often they will access those services at the workplace because they're not available in the community. And I think um, especially corporates like us, I'm talking about larger corporates Large that corporate, have yeah. um, the funds to, to back um, these schemes up, have always sort of generally done well. If you look at mm. most South African corporates, whether it be mining, manufacturing, etc., the bigger corporates have always responded pretty well to the mm. challenges of, um, uh, of, of, of health and wellness and corporate social yeah. responsibility targeted at their employees firstly. Um, I think then when you come into the business, you know, the link between health and wellness and employee performance and then uh, company performance is, is plain to see. Yeah. You, know, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to mm-hmm. see that. Um, and you, you kind of neglect the health and wellness issues of your people at your peril. Um, um, I think in our context, um, you know, we are largely a service-driven call center environment. Call centers, by their nature, employ sort of younger employees. Um, mm-hmm whose view on issues relating to mental health and how they respond to challenges of mental health is very different from other generations who yeah. might have been far more closed, far more secretive. I think younger employees are far more willing to engage, mm-hmm. far more willing to access help and, 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 and care services, etc. So, so, you know, employers play a massive role there um, because if they don't, I mean, the impact on organizational performance will be, will be direct. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you cannot expect that your employees leave their lives in compartments. Mm-hmm. When they when they leave their home in the morning, they leave all their worries there. And when they come into the office, they this motivated exactly. um, a person who's not influenced by what happens outside work. They are heavily influenced by what happens outside work. I also think, I mean, you know, aside from what's happening now with the, with the focus on mental health as a result of the pandemic, I mean, again, we have unique challenges in South Africa around... Mm-hmm. Um, crime, for example, and people's um, experience of um, um, things like gender-based violence, mm-hmm. etc., and how that plays out in the workplace. You know, exactly. If you've been a victim of a violent crime, um, again, uh, when you come into work after an incident over the weekend, on Monday morning, can your boss expect you to be highly motivated, focused, etc.? And the reality is they can't if you mm-hmm. are going through these challenges. And responsible employees will acknowledge that, and then they will provide the support services for those employees employees to ensure that they get the help that they need um so yeah that you know that that's um that's my firm view and and from our children's perspective been reasonably best because i think h it's not an hr challenge it's actually a business challenge and i've been blessed Mm -hmm. from a perspective that you know i've never had to go to the executive team with a begging bowl appealing to them to provide funds for sort of health and wellness initiatives yes. with our staff. It's always been acknowledged that it's a key part of it's our success yes, yes. and funds and the support from the executive team has always been available to ensure that we support our staff through these uh, uh, through, you know, through the difficult yeah. times. That's amazing. And it's yeah. actually so interesting. You said something earlier that, that really struck a chord, that it is, it's, it's, it's it's clear as day that without employee wellness, a business cannot function. Yet still so yeah. many businesses in the world don't have those kinds of... I mean, of course, a lot of it is owing to lack of resources or lack of funds. Yeah. But even certain businesses that do have um, funds, some of them just don't you know, make as much of an effort as you guys clearly do, which is just so awesome. It's amazing to yeah. see because our insurance... I mean, I remember being 
five years old and knowing what outsurance was because of the, the adverts and this and that and it's yeah. such a big business so it just it's very comforting knowing that corporates such as outsurance are making such a concerned effort to look after their employees and look after everyone yeah. involved which is just it's really amazing it's it's good to hear you know yeah just just another element of this i mean outsurance is a data-driven business and i mm-hmm. think most financial services companies are and you can see that linear line between employees in distress and their performance and service levels on the job. Mm -hmm. It's not even an indirect line, it's a direct Mm -hmm. line. Um, So when you run the numbers and you look at those employees who are experiencing health and wellness challenges, um, when you see the impact on on, on absenteeism and you work that backwards to see the impact on service and the impact on performance, that that, that, um, causal link is direct. Um, it's very direct. Um, I mean, you don't need you know to go and study health and wellness to know that there's a link. It's very direct. And and again, mm-hmm. like I said, you ignore that link at your peril because um, your employees just simply won't be in a position to service your clients' needs if exactly. they don't get the support. No, of course, of course. There's a saying that uh, goes something like, "You can't, you can't um, fill other people's uh, cups if yours is empty." And it's yes. it works very much so in businesses. You know. Yes. Uh, it's just, it's really good to know these things, that businesses such yeah. as yours is, is so great and on top of things in terms of employee wellness. It's just, it's a very refreshing thought, especially because it's such a big business. Yes. Um, and that actually also, again, links into the next question. So I always like um, the last question of these kind, kinds of interviews to be something, you know, in an ideal world. If there was, if you could do anything, what would you do to make sure that employee wellness could be maintained? Take financial restrictions or um, limitations in terms of resources out of the picture. Pretend those didn't exist. In your ideal world, how would employee wellness be promoted within yeah. any business? This is going to sound sort of almost typically HR and probably too <laughs> philosophical, but, but I think we need a kind of world. Fine. I really think we need a kind of world. And what I mean by that is, I think we need to make it easier for people to say help. Mm. Um, at the moment, the world, and I think it's not the entire world, but aspects of the world are just so harsh that you know a person asking for help is viewed, viewed in, a, in a negative way, viewed as weak, mm. viewed as, um, as stigmatized, etc. And a kind of world will acknowledge that people go through periods where they can't cope, mm. and that doesn't make them less of people. Exactly. Um, and, I, and, and, you know, there's, whole, there's, there's a whole number of subsets of what I'm saying around kindness. And I think it starts off with kindness as a key element of leadership behavior. Uh, because in organizations, um, you cannot achieve people results if your leaders do not display fundamental uh, care for their people. Um, so true. Um, so, so I think kindness as a key element of leadership behavior is important it's really Mm. important because you can't achieve anything as a corporate if you have leaders who drive results at all costs and don't care about the consequences of those results on their people um etc um so so and i i actually think just me personally i think we are in a period as a as a as a species human race where i think i do think there's a kindness deficit Mm. i think um there's a deficit in that we, we, we're chasing, um, we, we, there's a lot of focus on chasing success, chasing material goals, uh, chasing career goals, etc. Mm-hmm. that we fundamentally forgot that what defines us exactly. as a species is our human connections. Um, so, so you know, kindness, I think, is fundamental. Um, and I, I wish that, um, you know, every leadership program, whether it be an MBA or a corporate leadership program, sort of positions kindness as a key leadership behavior. Yeah. Um, because you need that. And the reason why I'm saying kindness is because I think when you're dealing with health and wellness, mental health issues, etc., cetera, um, people, the, the risk that people have is that they get alienated. They feel they're going to be stigmatized. But through kindness, I really think you can overcome exactly. all of that. Um, so so at a philosophical level, I mean, you asked me a theoretical question. I think, I think sort of moving more towards a kindness value system mm. i think is important for us as a species it'll just make things so much easier um i'm hopeful though because i i do think one of the things the pandemic did highlight was that um i mean people talk about the reset um i think the reset that we're looking for is the reset in terms of human connections yes. it's not a reset in terms of how organizations are run etc mm. it's just how do we connect to each other as, as humans because you know you, you don't the one thing the pandemic has taught us is that can't wait for your second chance um 
you may never get that second chance. Um, so, so that's at a high level. Um, I think I, I really think there's a kindness deficit. Um, I think it's it's even in organisations that are well funded in terms of well health and wellness initiatives. Often the barrier would be the absence of a culture of care at that leadership mm-hmm. level. So you've got great programs at corporate level where you know HR people are rolling out. Um, exciting things Mm -hmm. and then that employee goes to the immediate line manager and expects empathy and they don't get it and no matter what you do at a corporate level if they don't get empathy from the immediate boss the immediate leader it kind of undoes everything that's happening at the corporate level Um, and that's where kindness is a is a is a a deal maker or breaker so Mm -hmm. so it's a bit philosophical but that's me that's just who i am i I do think i i I think we need to be kinder to each other we need to um we need to care a little bit more um we need to understand that our relationships are the things that define us. Honestly, this was the most wonderful chat. Those are all the questions I have for you. But thank you. Just thank you for letting me chat to you and for um, yeah. informing me and our audience of your points and views on these kinds of topics. No, thanks very much for including me and all the best with the series. Thank you very, very much. And have an okay. awesome week.